Welcome to the Faith Broadcast. I'm Carrick Butler, the pastor of Faith Christian Center. Thanks for tuning in today. We believe today's message is going to help you live this lifestyle of faith. It's going to empower you to live a life that makes Jesus famous wherever you go. Open up your heart. We know God has something special just for you. And we believe that as you listen to today's message, something good is going to happen to you. So listen up. I'll talk to you today at the end of our broadcast. Well, good evening. I would like to welcome everybody to Midweek Bible Study. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so if you guys don't mind, I will jump right into it with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for another time of getting into your word, Father God, and increasing in the knowledge of God and of your son, Jesus Christ, and even increasing in the knowledge of ourselves, who we are in Christ and who he is in us. And so, God, we just ask for revelation, knowledge, and understanding and insight into the scriptures, Father God, and that, Father God, you'll give each and every one of us the grace to act on what we will learn tonight, Father. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are going to cause it to bear much fruit in our lives to the glory of God, and we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So... Pastor Carrick has just begun a series recently called Join the Resistance. Join the Resistance. And in that series, he has been really coming from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and using that really as a foundational text in that teaching. And it has been a real blessing. And I want to, um, it's in my heart to kind of stay in that same vein with what I'll be teaching on tonight. And so the title of my message tonight is Be Fruitful. Be Fruitful. Amen. And so the interesting thing about those two words, be fruitful, if you look in your Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 25, it's either 20, verse 25 or 26, those are the first two words that God spoke to mankind after creating us. When he created Adam and Eve, the first two words that he spoke over them was be fruitful. And so anyway, even though that's the title of my message tonight, you're going to find as we go through this, really we're going to be talking about and looking in the word about the importance of spiritual growth the importance of us maturing spiritually, okay? And so let's just go ahead and get started. Turn to John chapter 15, John chapter 15, and we're going to start with verse 1. John chapter 15, and we're going to start with verse 1. All right. So this is Jesus speaking, and this is what he says. He said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, ex itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except you abide in me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Amen. So, I just want to uh, just take a moment, first of all, I feel like I have to do this whenever I read this passage of Scripture, because it's so many of us have been ino inoculated with such a religious, performance-based way of perceiving God, and such a religious, performance-based way of perceiving our relationship with God, that we look at verse 2, in a in a religious way okay so where Jesus said every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away talking about the father uh, and every branch in me that beareth fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit 
it's important for you to understand that that word that's translated taketh away is not what your religious mind think it's saying. You know, it sounds like at a surface level when you're reading that verse, if you unfruitful, the Father is going to just take you out of Jesus and you're going to get kicked out of the kingdom because you ain't no good to him. That is not what that's saying. The Greek word translated taketh away there is a Greek word called ero, ero, like A-I-R-O. And what it means is to lift up. Okay, and so Jesus has given us a picture of horticulture here because you got to remember that in those days it was basically an agrarian society where everything was agricultural, you know, it was just fishing and, and agriculture. And so he was able to minister to them and get them to see spiritual truths through giving a picture of agriculture. All right. And so in the Middle East and in that Mediterranean region, uh, wine is is a part of their culture. OK, and you, you make wine with grapes. And so this is just a picture that he's he's giving them a picture of spiritual growth here. And he's saying that every branch in me that bears not fruit, the father takes it away. He's the husbandman. He's the vine dresser. And so what that's saying is sometimes in horticulture, the, the branches of grape vines will, will, will grow downward and it'll get in the dirt. OK, and if that happens, then it's not going to be fruitful because it's not getting enough light from the sun. And so the husbandman, he comes and he lifts up that branch so that it can be exposed to more sunlight. And what he's saying here is any believer that is unfruitful, he is going to, if they cooperate with him, give them more light from the sun. He is going to lift them up out of all of that dirt (laughs) that is causing them to be unfruitful in the kingdom and give them more exposure to the sun. Amen. S-O-N, sun. Amen. And so that's what Jesus is saying here. And that's why he said in um, verse three, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Because the husbandman, the vine dresser, the farmer, he would clean that branch off and get it, get all of the dirt and all that mess off so that it can, it can, you know, it can, it can grow. It can, it can produce fruit. It could get sunlight. Amen. And so that's what we have to remember. All right. Just wanted to talk about that for a minute. And now in verse four, I want to get something else out of the way as well about verse four. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. Amen. And so. You have to understand in that verse, Jesus is speaking of the new birth, getting them prepared for the new birth, getting them prepared to be born again. Okay, and so do me a favor. Uh, Let's see. Turn to first John chapter four. First John chapter four. And let's look at verse 15. 1 John chapter 4, and let's look at verse 15. I'm getting back to my message. I'm just trying to get some things established here first about being fruitful, okay? Uh, John chapter, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 15. So it says this, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. So this is speaking of you being born again. When you got born again, you confess that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. You believed it and you confessed it. Okay. And so it's saying if you've done that, if you're born again, God dwells in you and you dwell in God. Now, this is interesting and because it's like John chapter 15 and verse 4 is speaking of abiding in Jesus. 
And then John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 15, is talking about uh, dwelling in God. And so it's like the reverse of the same thing. It's the same author. The first one is John 15, 4. This is 1 John 4, 15. And it's still the same subject matter. Let me prove that to you. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. The word dwelleth in 1 John 4, 15 is the same Greek word that's used in John chapter 15, verse 4, where Jesus said, abide in me. Okay, and so it's the same Greek word. In other words, if you are born again, God abides in you and you abide in God. Amen. So turn to John, John 17 and verse 22. I'm going to stick right here just for a minute. John chapter 17 and verse 22, because I want to. Uh, I want to kill something else real quick. What well, Jesus said, um, you know, abide in him, no. That's saying you abide in God. Listen, God and Jesus are one and the same. All right? So go to John chapter 17, verse 22. I'm, I need to get there myself. John 17, 22. Look at what Jesus said. He said, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one, okay? That word one, Jesus just said that he and the Father are one. That word one is a Greek word called hes, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Verse, and verse 8. John chapter 14 and verse 8. 8 and 9, actually. John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. I'm just building, I'm just laying the foundation for this message. I want you to know that you are always in a position of victory as a born-again believer. Amen. So it says this, Philip saith unto him, talking to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And look at Jesus' response. Jesus saith unto him, listen to how he say this. Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Philip just said, show us the Father God, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you, and you still don't know me, Philip? <laughs> He's saying that you looking at him. Amen. Go to 1 Timothy 3.16. And these are just a few scriptures. This is just a, a few scriptures to establish this. Jesus and God are one and the same. So look, it says in verse, 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. Look at this. This scripture is referring to Jesus. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So Jesus and God are one and the same. What am I trying to say? 1 John 4, 15, if God dwells in you or abides in you, Jesus abides in you. If you dwell or abide in God, you dwell or abide in Jesus. So John 15, 4 is saying, and it's showing that if you born again, you are already positioned to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. Amen. You are already positioned to be fruitful in the kingdom. That's what John 15, 4 is saying. But here's the thing. Just because you are born again, it doesn't mean that being fruitful is automatic. 
It simply means, again, that you are positioned to be fruitful. So the new birth is simply how the process of being fruitful begins. Amen? Y'all stay with me on this. So having established that, let's consider something Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 44. Let's go there. Luke chapter 6, and let's look at verse 44. Luke chapter 6 and verse 44. We're talking about being fruitful, and you're getting ready to see the importance of growing up spiritually. Amen. So look at this, Luke 6, 44. This is Jesus talking. He said, for every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. Okay? So Jesus just said in modern day vernacular, the way that you know the kind of tree that a tree is, is by the fruit that you see on it. So when you see the fruit on the tree, you can identify the tree. That's basically what he's saying. All right? So let me give you an example of what I mean by that and then we'll tie it back in to what Jesus said about a tree being known by its fruit. I want everybody to look at your screen and I want you to tell me what kind of tree this is. Look at your screen and type in the comments, tell me what kind of tree this is. Listen, I don't want you to guess. Don't be guessing. If you can't look at it and tell me exactly what kind of tree it is, just put a question mark in the comments, okay? But I want you to tell me what kind of tree that is. Go ahead. All right. Now, now I want you to tell me what type of tree this is. Now, I'm, I want you to put it in the comments. Now, I'm hoping that the picture is clear enough for you to be able to tell. So if some of y'all put the wrong kind of tree, I'm going to just attribute that to, you know, the picture not being quite clear enough for you to be able to tell. All right. So now let me go ahead and give you the answer. Here's the answer. And you can take the picture down now if, if it's not down yet. So both of those pictures that you just looked at are apple trees both of them the first one is an apple tree and so is the second one so you could only tell unless you some kind of botanist I don't know maybe we got some botanists watching I don't know <laughs> but unless you some kind some type of botanist you could not tell looking at that first picture that that was an apple tree but you could tell it was an apple tree looking at the second picture because of the fruit that you saw on it. Amen. But here's the, here's the interesting thing about that. The first tree was simply an immature apple tree. But get this. It was just as much an apple tree as the one that had apples on it. Just because it didn't have apples on it, and because it was an immature, because it was immature, didn't mean it wasn't an apple tree. It was just as much an apple tree. But you knew the second one was an apple tree because you could see the fruit of it. Amen. And so the same is true as Christians. Don't be so quick to judge a Christian because you don't see any fruit in their life yet. You know, they may still have the fruit of the world being on display in their life. But it just simply means that they immature. They have not grown up in the knowledge of God. They have not grown up in the knowledge of the word. Their mind is not renewed. I'm getting ahead of myself. So how do we grow, though? So the first thing you need to understand once you're born again is that your spirit is not the issue. Remember, you are a tripart being. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, you are a spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit being. You have a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you live inside of a physical body. 
Now, when you got born again, the only part of you that changed was your spirit. It was an instant transformation, and I want us to look at that for a minute. I want us to see the condition of the born-again spirit so that you can see where the issue really is about us being unfruitful, all right? So when you get born again, your spirit is born of God. Go to 1 John chapter 5. Go to 1 John chapter 5, and this is an instant supernatural occurrence that happens on the inside of you through the work of the Holy Spirit. You might not feel no goosebumps or nothing, but it is real. Amen. Look at 1 John chapter 4, I mean chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, it says this, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. And so it said in verse 4, whatsoever is born of God, okay? That means whosoever is born of God, all right? You are born of God. And Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9, let's go there real quick. Hebrews 12. In verse 9, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9, I want to point to just one part of this verse here. Actually, the last part of this verse, but we'll read the whole verse, but I want to point you to something that's said in the last part. Hebrews 12 and verse 9, it says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So God is the Father of your born-again spirit. He is, the, your spirit is born of God. Amen. And so look at Colossians 3. Go to Colossians 3 and verse 10. Colossians 3 and verse 10. <clears throat> Colossians 3 and verse 10, it says this. You are made in the image of God. Your born again spirit is made in the image of God. Look at what it says. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Go to 1 John 4, and we're going to look at verse 17. 1 John chapter 4. In verse 17, 1 John 4, 17, 1 John 4, 17, I'm just, we're going to get to the, to the, the, the conclusion of this matter, but I'm just working toward that. It says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, talking about Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so shall we be in the world to come, so are we right now in this world. Just as perfect and flawless as Jesus is, seated at the right hand of God. And so you can see already, that got to be talking about my born again spirit, because I know my thoughts ain't perfect. I know my actions ain't perfect. That's talking about the inner you, the real you that was born again. All right. And so also, First uh, Corinthians six seventeen. I probably just mentioned some of these verses, but you can look at it on your own. First Corinthians six seventeen says, "He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit." So your born again spirit is one with the Holy Spirit. And that's, again, the same Greek word one, I mean, the, the same Greek word hes, that they translated one, a singular one, to the exclusion of another. That is how perfect your born-again spirit is. Your born-again spirit is complete. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. Let's look at this. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. I'm showing you guys the condition of the real you. In the sight of God, this is what he sees. This is the real you once you're born again. Look at this. It says, uh, Colossians 2.10, 
and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power in Jesus you are complete and that word complete is a Greek word that means full it means perfect it means replete replete means well supplied your born again spirit is well supplied with the life of God, with the nature of God, with the character of God, with the power of God. That is the condition of your born again spirit. Amen. And so, and then on top of that, if it, as if that wasn't enough, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 says that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now that word sealed in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, it doesn't just mean like a stamp. It doesn't just mean like some type of stamp or seal that's on you to mark you. It means sealed up so that nothing can defile it. So all of that good that we just looked at, and that was just a few verses, all of that good about your born-again spirit, it cannot be defiled by the corruption of this world because the Holy Spirit has set a supernatural seal upon it. You don't believe me? Well, interestingly enough, the word sealed in Ephesians 1.13 is the same Greek word that's used in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2 and 3. Go there, Revelation 20. I just want to make this point. Revelation 20, verse 2 and 3. All right. We're going to get back to spiritual maturity. I'm just trying to show you guys that the issue is not with the, the, your born-again spirit. I'm about to tell you and show you where the issue is. And we're going to close out. We're going to conclude the matter with that. All right. So look at Revelation 20 and verse 2 and 3. And he, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Uh, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season so this is talking about in the end times what's going to happen with the devil for a period of a thousand years he's going to be cast into the bottomless pit and notice in verse 3 that he's going to be shut up in it and sealed a seal going to be set upon him so what that's saying is this, he's going to be thrown into the bottomless pit and it's going to be sealed so he can't get out. That's what that's saying for a thousand years and then he's going to be loosed after that for a little season. But he can't get out because he's been sealed up in the bottomless pit. It's been shut and sealed. And so that's the same Greek word that's used in Ephesians 1.13 where it says your spirit has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has put a supernatural seal around you so that none of all of, none of that, I mean, nothing of this fallen world, no corruption, no sin or corruption can even penetrate it. Amen. That makes sense because you and the Holy Spirit are one. If it could penetrate it, you would become separated from God again. But that can't happen anymore. Jesus abolished that. That's a whole nother message. So I'm not going to go into that. But I just wanted to establish in, at this point of the message that your, uh, the, the, the growth, the spiritual growth, I don't believe, I can't see that it's in your born again spirit. I don't believe, listen, y'all believe what you want, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying you got to believe the way I do, but I don't believe that when you get born again, that you get a baby, a little baby infant spirit on the inside of you and it's, ah, you know, I don't believe that. I believe that the maturity, the, the maturity happens in the renewing of your mind. I believe your spirit is complete, like totally just 
full of the life of God, just as Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus is not a baby sitting at the right hand of God. So I'm just saying that's the way, that's what I believe. So let's, let's do this. The issue then must be with our soul. So what must we do about it? What do we do about it? If we see the issue ain't with our spirit, it must be our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. Remember, your soul did not change at the new birth. Your soul did not change. Only your spirit, which is the real you. Your mind, will, and emotions did not change. They did not, it did not get saved. Amen. And so listen, you don't, you don't believe me? I guarantee you, if you didn't know calculus, before you got born again, you didn't suddenly get born again and no calculus, okay? Whatever you didn't know prior to getting born again, you still didn't know, okay? You still had the same stinking thinking, all of that going on in your soul. So that is the issue. So go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. And all of you believers out here that's saying, well, I've been in the Word for 50 years, and I don't need this teaching. Now, I got news for you, too. You just stay with me as well. This is for everybody. Everybody need to hear this. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. So you get in the word and the word will begin to cause you to grow up in the things of God. And you start off with milk. Go to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. Hebrews 5 and verse 12 and 13. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 and 13. And as you grow in the word, you will come to the place where God is able to entrust you with deeper revelation of the word. You'll begin to eat of the meat of the word. Amen. So. Uh, Hebrews 5 and verse 12 it says for when for the time you ought to be teachers you have one you have need that one teach you again the, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and you are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe we're going to come back to that. Verse 13, he just says something real strong. Actually, we're going to go ahead and talk about it right now. So uh, here's the thing. First, before I, before I talk about that, I just want to say a babe in Christ is basically somebody who is carnally minded. Okay? Carnally minded simply means of the five physical senses. In other words, they, even though they're born again, they still live their life and perceive situations and circumstances and, and their approach and their response is based off what they can see, hear, taste, smell, and feel. So they still talking like the world, they still acting like the world, they still thinking like the world. That's all that means. And we're going to look at that in a minute. But it just means to be carnally minded. All right. So that is that is one indicator of being a babe in Christ. And you just need to get in the word and let the word begin to grow you up. And so here's another thing. I'm about to trip some of the more, quote unquote, grown believers out with this next thing. But here's the thing. Also, if you still think and believe that righteousness you being right with God is based on your obedience and you believe that the blessing and favor of God that you earn it through your obedience you are babe you are immature spiritually go to Galatians chapter 4 and we're going to look at verse 1 through 3 Galatians chapter 4 I'm kind of getting them to my next message but we're going to look at it anyway. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1 through 3. Look at what this says. Look at what this says. All right. Paul said to the Galatian churches, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. 
but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the, um, actually, no, that's where I want to stop at. Even when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world, okay? And so the context of the book of Galatians, for this to make sense, you have to understand that Paul was addressing the issue of Judaizers coming in, trying to bring believers back under a performance-based way of relating to God. I cannot expound on that. I don't have the time. But that's the context of the book of Galatians. And he's saying when we were under that type of covenant, we were children, immature, okay? But Jesus brought us into the new covenant, which is a covenant of grace where we're led by the Spirit, and that is where spiritual maturity is. Amen. All right, so I just wanted to get that out of here. So uh, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm just saying that if you believe that, that is your obedience that earns you the blessing and favor of God or is your obedience that makes you right with God or keeps you right with God that is an indicator you spiritually immature I'm not saying you shouldn't be obedient to God I'm not saying that God doesn't bless us and favor us I'm saying that it is why you doing it what you believe about why you doing it is important and it shows whether you are mature or not so what happens when we get serious about feeding on the word? We can see that feeding on the word is what causes us to grow up spiritually. So what happens? So your mind will begin to be renewed, and that's where spiritual growth happens. Remember what I said. A babe in Christ is simply somebody who has a carnal mind, a believer with a carnal mind. When you become spiritually minded, go to Romans 8 chapter 8 and verse 6 we got just a few minutes left Romans chapter 8 and verse 6 I'm talking about the importance of growing up spiritually so that you can be fruitful in the kingdom amen look at this Romans chapter 8 and verse 6 says for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace so to have a to be of the five senses and perceive everything based on what you can see, hear, taste, smell, or feel, and not by faith is to be carnally minded, and it says that's death. So how do you become spiritually minded? John chapter 6, 63, Jesus said, The word I speak unto you, my, it is spirit and life. Okay? So the word is spirit. So being spiritually minded is being word minded. So that means you need to feed on the word and look at and, and look at this. Go to Mark Matthew chapter four and verse four. Matthew chapter four and verse four. You need to feed on the word in order to become spiritually minded. And that is where spiritual growth happens. The more spiritually minded you become, the more you grow up in the kingdom of God and the more fruitful you'll become. But look at this. What about that? What about feeding on the word? Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 4 and verse 4. He said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let me just put that in modern-day vernacular. Jesus is saying, Just the way that you live by food, you need to live by the word. Everybody that's watching this, eat food every day several times a day for most of us and he's saying Jesus is saying the same value you place on food is the same value you give to the word to feeding on the word every single day you need to be feeding on the word and letting it change your mind go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 real quick Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 look at this now, we just saw we need to feed on the word. Look at this every day. It says in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It said, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The, re the word renew, as Pastor said, means to renovate. 
That means God got to gut out all of this wrong thinking, all of this carnal thinking, and put in his thoughts. And his thoughts come from the word. Amen. And when you do that, that transformation that has already taken place in your born again spirit will begin to have expression in your life. You will begin to all of that good stuff about your born again spirit will begin to be expressed in your thoughts, in your words, in your actions. And when that happens, guess what? Fruit is going to be born. Amen. And so at what hap what happened to your soul as you begin to submit your thinking to the word? What I just said, your spirit will begin to manifest in your soulish realm. So you got to understand, go to James chapter one, James chapter one, and we're going to end here. James chapter one and verse 22. James chapter one and verse. Actually, let's look at verse 21. James chapter one, 21. Look at what he said. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your what? Your souls. He's talking to believers. You already born again. Your spirit already saved, but not your soul. The way your soul begins to experience that salvation, the way that salvation that's in your spirit will begin to be released into your soul is through you uh, receiving the word of God and eating of the word of God. And then in verse 22, it says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so when you renew your mind to the word, and you begin to make a decision to act on the word, not out of a sense of performance, not out of a sense of trying to earn the blessing and favor of God, not out of the sense of you trying to be right with God through your actions. That's not, that ain't how New Testament righteousness is produced. It's given to you as a gift. But you act on the word simply out of position of trusting God. So you acting on the word because you believe what he said and you trust him. And then you know what's going to happen? You're going to find yourself being more fruitful accidentally than you ever have on purpose. If you just let the word of God renovate your mind and you just make a decision to trust God and acting on the word just out of trust because you know he loves you and he got your best interest at heart, you are going to be bearing fruit for the kingdom. Now listen, the, the speed at which you become fruitful is up to you. The speed of mature, uh, spiritual growth is up to you. There's a tree that's near my house that's around the corner. Uh, it's, it's a small tree, and we got our tree at about the same time, and they were about the same size. My tree is now some 30 feet tall, but the tree around the corner from my house is the same height it was from the beginning. I don't know why. It's weird. But, I mean, I'm talking about this has been years. And for some reason, it has grown nothing. It has not grown at all. And ours have sprouted up as big as bushy birds nesting in it, everything. And so you got to, it's all up to you. And if you have already matured spiritually, stick with the word because you'll go backwards if you don't. You will go back into being having a carnal mind if you back away from the word and you will become a baby again in the things of God. I've seen it happen to believers full of faith, living by faith, full of the spirit, you know, and they got back off the word and they now they back into carnality, born again, going to heaven, but not living by faith, not trusting God. Amen. So this is a very important subject. I pray that each and every one of you has gotten something out of this. Say, I will feed on the word every day because I know that is, is the will of God for me to be fruitful in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen.
Thanks for watching today. We hope today's message was a blessing to you that it empowered you to make Jesus famous in every area of your life. Hey, if you want to be a part of what God's doing here at Faith, you know, our vision statement is to ignite an awakening that impacts Georgia and influences the world through the power of the love of Jesus. And we'd love for you to be a part. You can find out our different experience times and our different locations by going to FCCGA.com. If you want to give, you can text FCCGA to 73256. You can also go to FCCGA.com to give online and be a part of what God's doing here. We'd love to see you anytime you're in our area. We believe God has something good just for you. And anytime you come to our faith experience, we believe you will experience God and his plan for your life. So thank you for tuning in today. We'll see you next time.